Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a uh, more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. Hey, you're listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here to discuss our May 2023 book club pick, The Fortunes of Jaded Women uh, by Carolyn Quinn. And to help us discuss this book, we actually brought in a special guest, um, our fellow potluck podcaster and my co-host for the Good Pop Culture Club, Han Nguyen. Hey, hey. Welcome to the show. Yay. Happy to be here. No, we were and I were always talking about how we want to include more friends and fellow Pollock people on our podcast. And just reading this book, I was like, we should get Han to talk about this. Not only because she can give us the insights of a Vietnamese woman, but also because um, Han also reads a lot. So I was excited to get That's Han true. In. It's the nature of your job, right? Because you <laughs> yeah. get a lot of books. Yeah, I get a lot of books, but also I think um, the nature of my workout is that I listen to a lot of audiobooks because they keep me going. So, yes, yeah. I, this was one that was um, I had read a while back. So I was yeah. happy that Marvin actually mentioned it. Yeah. So excited to have you on the show. Excited to get into this book, which whew, it's a great book. But, man, there are so many characters. Um I guess we can just jump right in. Well, first of all, hope everyone had a great Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Uh, we are now into June. So, yeah, we made it through. Congratulations, everybody. Hello. <sighs> I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's always the mood after uh, APAM. We're just like, all of us are so tired of of the emotional labor. <laughs> also, <laughs> just event planning. And yeah, yeah like... Kudos to everyone in the community who, you know, had to do all the things this past month. Yeah. Well, we was tired because she went on a K-pop spree, which you will hear about if you're subscribed <sighs> to our Honey Boba tier in our Patreon, because um, we talked about that in our Boba Chat episode earlier this week. So, um, yeah, we're, we're going to keep mum on it here because you should go check it out. Um, but <laughs> let's get into it because there's, there's a lot to go over in this book. So um, before we get started, as always, there will be spoilers in our discussion. We'll be talking about the book in its entirety. So if you have not read the book yet and care about being spoiled, um, this is where you should hit pause and come back when you finished. Um, but to get started, Rira, can you start us off with the book jacket description? All right. It started with their ancestor, Wang, who dared to leave her marriage for true love. So a fearsome Vietnamese witch cursed Wang and her descendants so that they would never find love or happiness. And the Zung woman would give birth to daughters, never sons. 
Huang's current descendant, Mai Wen, knows this curse well. She's divorced, and after an explosive disagreement a decade ago, she's estranged from her younger sisters, Min Fam, the middle and the mediator, uh, Quen Lam, the youngest who swears she runs just a humble coffee shops and nail salons, not Little Saigon's underground. Though Mai's three adult daughters, Priscilla, Tui, and Tao, are successful in their careers, the same can't be said for their love lives. Mai is convinced they might drive her to an early grave. Desperate for guidance, she consults Auntie Hua, her trusted psychic in Hawaii, who delivers an unexpected prediction. This year, her family will witness a marriage, a funeral, and the birth of a son. This prophecy will reunite estranged mothers, daughters, aunts, and cousins, for better or for worse. Yeah. I guess, first of all, I love that the setup for this book is like the most pettiest curse in the world. I mean, we're Asians. Like, we we do petty. Like, <laughs> uh, family yeah. feuds are, 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 are up there. <laughs> there. There are still things in my family that I'm just like, wait, how did this start? And then they're like, they can't really tell me or they're embarrassed to tell me. And, I, and, that, and whatever they do tell me <laughs> makes zero sense. Um, yeah, that's that definitely happens. <laughs> yeah, I, I do love that the curse, quote unquote, and, you know, whether or not the curse actually exists is something that we can talk about later on when we talk about the themes. But it's a curse couched in like patriarchal slash Confucian like practices, which is only sons are able to welcome ancestors into the house. And if you only have daughters, then your souls will, the souls of your family will forever wander and never able to come home. And for a petty curse, it makes a lot of sense why they would want to do that, right? Yeah, and also just like, I love how it's revenge for, uh, it's like, how dare Wong like dump my son for a Cambodian man and for love for all that matters. (laughs) If he was rich at least i could understand but (laughs) it's yeah yeah that tracks i i could totally see that like how (laughs) dare she first of all not even a vietnamese person (laughs) that's true yep Yep. the insularness is just like yeah on uh, spot on yeah well i guess to start off our discussion how did you guys find um the book itself um, I know me personally, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of like, it was it was chaotic because there's just so many characters. But for like a book that had like a bajillion characters, the stories were actually pretty easy to track, I found. And maybe part of it is because I grew up amongst Vietnamese. I was trying to think about like most of my friends in high school were like Vietnamese or Vietnamese Chinese. So um, I grew up amongst these families and I've seen <laughs> these conflicts in real life. Yeah, I, I think that was something that, yes, a lot of characters. Um, I never really got confused when I initially read it. I think a few months later now I'm kind of trying to remember who's who. But um, it, it is something that you kind of have to remember not just who someone is, but how they're related to someone else. That's very important to understand the messiness <laughs> at hand and the depth of the messiness. And this book is messy in the best way um, because of the relationships, the little slights, the things that happen you know, between family members, people who are supposed to be close, and of course, you don't talk. Um, so I found it incredibly fun in a very specific way, not just with the family um, dynamics, but also the, of course, a lot of it happens in Little Saigon. You know, um, there's LA-ish, you know, uh, SoCal locales, um, (laughs) which were great to just a lot of name dropping. (laughs) Um, And yeah, so I, it, it was a lot of fun, especially because it felt in so many ways familiar, grounded, um, but also very lively. You know, I think there is a, a sort of a rollicking sensibility here <laughs> that I was just like, oh, I guess I just better hold on because I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, when we think of mother daughter stories, especially when it comes to like Asian immigrant stories, I feel like the first thing that comes to mind is like uh, Amy Tan's Joy Luck Club. And that Oof. can be quite a heavy read. I mean, I wouldn't know because I've never <laughs> I've never read um, Joy Luck Club. Same. And and it's just like. This book is very funny. Like the characters are very, um, they can be very ridiculous, but at the same time, I think they're very realistic in terms of just like how uh, hysterical Asian women can be, Asian aunties (laughs) can be. 
And um, as someone who grew up in primarily in the East Coast and in the South, uh, I didn't really grow up around a lot of Vietnamese uh, people. We didn't really have much of a Vietnamese community. So it was really nice to uh, just kind of like get a glimpse uh, on like little Saigon in Orange County. I mean, my family lives in Orange County now, and it's it's a side that I don't get to see because obviously like my parents are Korean and they're more ingrained in the uh, Korean community. So I found a lot of things like really interesting and I'm like, oh, so this is what like Southern California Asians are defined as. <laughs> and it's like, oh, there are like there there are subcultures that I would have never understood unless I had uh, picked up this book. So I thought it was pretty refreshing. Yeah, OC Koreans and OC Vietnamese are kind of two, I guess, class-wise opposed communities, I feel I, like. Uh, you know what? You're you're right about that. But also, I would have to say Houston Vietnamese community because there were definitely some things when me, my, on, in my reading of this that I was like, oh, I wonder what if that's what I would experience if I had grown up here, you know, in, in SoCal <laughs> or uh, – yeah. yeah. I mean, so the the book mainly takes place in Westminster, which is Little Saigon. It's like where a big enclave of Vietnamese Americans live. Um, and a fun fact is like Asian culture from the early 2000s originated from this area, from like the, the ABGs of Westminster and, you know, cultures that spawn things like bikini coffee places, which still kind of operate on a down low today. I have not experienced that. And so that was definitely one of the things I was like, is this an OC thing? Yeah, same uh, here. I was <laughs> like, is this real? Like, I, I know like in, in Cre- like K-Town culture, there's Tommy's like uh, like an escort type of it's, thing. And I was like, this is weird. Like, I've never heard of this uh, bikini coffee shop culture, but. <laughs> it's similar to, and then they mentioned this in the book. It's similar to how like Hooters is a place for wings, is it, right? These coffee places are a place or, for or Japanese maid cafes, where it's just uh, the aesthetic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the aesthetic. Yeah, it's the aesthetic, but also clientele are, you they're, know, they're, they're there to leer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. And they're known to be where people who may operate in the underground mm. congregate. Um, see, yeah. this is su- such a learning experience. <laughs> yeah, I also learned like. Yeah. How much, um, I guess, like, like one of the characters, uh, uh, Quen Lam, the, uh, the owner of these coffee shops and nail salons, uh, like just how she, uh, uses her children as free labor. And oh, also yeah. like, she is like deathly afraid of taxes. Like she mentions it quite often being like double income taxes in California, they'll kill you. And, uh, how like <laughs> cash and, how gold bars, jade, and cash are like the main currency. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like that's uh, not Yeah. I grew up amongst pho restaurant owning families, and that is definitely very accurate. Um Chinese restaurant families also operate similarly. Gold bars are so true. Um, whatever it is, they want a physical you know, like representation of their money. They don't believe in, you know, like banks as much or at least not really or definitely not digital. Like I'm wondering how certain OG, you know, uh, Vietnamese are operating when it comes to things like Venmo and stuff. Probably not at all. Probably yeah. not. Uh, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I may even think about it. They grew up in a era where institutions don't last, right? They're cut. They're the countries that they belong to, the institutions behind those, like those have all fallen apart or don't exist. So there's really like, there's no trust for yeah. institutions, even as they like become refugees of like one of the more stable financial countries in the world. It's like, no, this this could all disappear. We all might need to run one day. So I need everything physically. Yeah, no on trust me. for institutions or people in authority who want to take your money. Um, I know <laughs> hiding money besides like just gold bars, but I, I wonder about sometimes when like, I don't want to say this grimly, but like certain old people die. And then when people are going through their homes, they're probably finding money all over the place. Um, Because I remember when my grandmother was like dying, um, she was sort of saying weird words. And I was just like pulling my mom and my aunt into the room. And I was like, (laughs) what's like the money's in the banana stand? It was in a skein of yarn. Okay. (laughs) 
Because she was saying, like, pointing to a closet, and I was like, I brought her some yarn. I was like, I don't know why she wants yarn. And then my mom's like, oh. So she, she's like, she, she was saying the word, like, apple, but it also means to unwind. And it see, puns everywhere, um, hidden money, just all of this is very true. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you yeah. can't trust anyone else with your money. You have to hide it on your person or around your house. I mean, when the matriarch passes away at the end of the first, and the first at the beginning of the second act, I was actually impressed that she left in her will directions to where all the gold is hidden, because my grandmother did not do that. We're still finding gold I, hidden in like furniture. I think even that's today. A, a good little fantastical element in this book, <laughs> which is clear directions uh, in a will. I I think. It's more accurate to what your experience is, is when someone dies, all the secrets somehow trickle out and you're still left wondering what the hell is going on. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Like the whole um, like competition between all of the uh, the mother's generation sisters, like who are like, I can't believe grand like I can't believe my mother left the Santa Ana house to Keem. Like like uh, she's not really like our sister. And they're all like. Uh, kind of like holding on to grudges and that just reminded me a lot of just Asian families in general um you know you like like you you worry about like who's getting what like in terms of inheritance um I know like my family like my dad has like five siblings so it was definitely like a not a bloodbath, but it was definitely like a Game of Thrones situation of <laughs> like who's getting uh, these properties, who's getting the jewelry. And surprisingly enough, like when my grandmother actually passed away like two years ago, like they were fine. <laughs> like, it was just like all the way up <laughs> until like leading to her death. It was just like who's getting what, who's the favorite, which grandchild is going to get all of this stuff, blah, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. So, um, yeah, a lot of that was very familiar. I'm sure uh, other cultures where, like, big families uh, are a thing, like, that's probably something that they can relate to as well. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The things that families can fight over are just really gross. Like, I'm not going to name names or genders, but, like, in my family, when a grandparent died, there is definitely a fight with certain aunts about whose kid got to hold the photo of <laughs> the deceased. Um, oh my god. Yeah. Oh, it was just really weird. I, I just was kind of like trying to disappear into the woodwork when that was happening. Uh, yeah, that felt to me as the second oldest grandson because my cousin wasn't able to make it back to Taiwan. Which was weird because my older cousins my older female cousins were there but you know asian cultures yeah this um, was a patriarchal uh yeah uh fight by the way it based on <laughs> whose daughter or yeah. who was the son who, whose daughter was yeah it was yeah in my experience the estate battles get really heated whenever there's property involved, oh yeah. which is something that <laughs> happens in in this book as well like when you're talking about who gets the house then everyone starts like yeah like families break apart because of those fights and families did break apart in this book right yeah. also like asian families are very good at just like not talking to each other for years okay like after <laughs> like my aunt kind of slighted my father like they did not talk for like 8 years and it was just i was just like how can you just mm-hmm. go it's like such a long stretch of time just like not talking to each other obviously like he like interacted with like his sister's uh, children, but it was like like when it came to her, he was just like, nope, I'm not talking to her. And I'm like, OK, yeah, this is something that is sort of alluded to in the book where all of a sudden someone shows up who they thought was dead. And it's amazing how this happens in families where it's just basically like someone doesn't exist or this fact does not exist until suddenly it does again. And I was, at, I remember as a kid just being clued into certain people existing all of a sudden. Um, like, they were like, here's your aunt. I was like, wait, I have another one? And it's like, <laughs> and here's your grandparents. I was like, well, I've never heard of these people before. Um, uh, kind of like a Schrodinger's yes. family, right? Like, <laughs> and, you know, I, I imagine this type of thing is very common, especially with the refugee mm-hmm. communities that came in the wake of the Vietnam War, right? The the Cambodians, Lao, Vietnamese that, you know, like they had to flee quickly. And 
I mean, I know family members lost touch. And, you know, this is another plot point in the story. And a lot of the story, one of the main themes is like the effects that generational trauma and refugee trauma has on on this family. And exploring the fact that like this idea to marry for love, which was not an option for refugees trying to establish themselves. Like, you know, we had the scene where Li Zong, the matriarch of the family, kind of just doesn't even sell off her daughter, just like pairs her daughter up with like the first guy she sees to like give her like stability, right? Because this is the only way she can have property under her name. Yeah, I I think there's a lot of make do sort of situations. Um, Not, I mean, we have also in, as in many Asian cultures, um, arranged marriages. So this is kind of like the extension of that, but sort of like in the new world, I guess. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and it's 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 also is what kind of lends the conversation to the book as far as like should people be pairing up for love um or other reasons um yeah it's uh, it was a i've i don't know if all of you have also heard about um arranged marriages in your family but i have heard a lot of stories um about my grandparents and even great grandparents so this one was interesting in that it was basically my mom's generation that they're, they're kind of talking about here. Um, so, which I feel like was sort of abolished by then. So it was a, it, it was an interesting touch, but I also feel like it's not unheard of probably still. Yeah. I mean, if you've watched a documentary by Kulip Vlasek about her experience, like her father is actually her stepfather and her mother married him out of necessity when they immigrate, they met in refugee camps and basically couples and families were more likely to be patriated than single people. Mm-hmm. And so that's why they decided to get married. I mean, that's still the case today. People yeah. still get married so they can get an easy, an easier path to citizenship. Um, I'm sure like... Which is another plot point in this yeah, book too yeah, later it on. is. Um, but I do want to go to like the beginning of this book where um, you have Mai going to Hawaii to meet the psychic to get the predictions for um, that coming year. And I thought that was like really interesting because fortune telling is, Mm. I don't know, like it can be really intense in Asian culture. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. One example is a fortune teller um, told my paternal grandmother that she should not be raising her son for his childhood. So my dad actually got sent away and was raised by other people for the first like 11 years of his life. Um, and so that's why my grandmother actually favored her second son. And so it, there was a w- totally weird dynamic where when they finally got back together again, um, my father was um, raised with the utmost elite, you know, sort of like beha- uh, like treatment. Like he didn't have to go upstairs by himself. Someone carried him. I I don't know why I'm related to this guy. But anyway, um, yeah. And so but that also meant that um, my grandmother, when she came to the States for a little bit, acted like sort of a stranger to my dad. But she was still living with us. We had sort of no connection with her. They were just odd, odd dynamics. And then when my uncle came over, she was all over them and his kids. So I was just like, this is so strange. So actually, I'm not close with my father's side of the family because of that whole thing. Um, And I know that's sort of usually a gender thing, but yeah, so I grew up with all of my mother's family, but because of this fortune teller, um, it created this situation where my father um, doesn't have that uh, sort of connection with his family. And therefore, you know, if you want to talk about generational traumas, like I feel like that also uh, informed his relationship with us, his kids um, and how, you know, you know, he was a nice, Nice guy, but maybe not the most uh, in touch with us. I know this fortune teller turns out to be an actual witch, <laughs> but like, I don't think for I don't, how, I don't understand how they can have so much power that they do. But like, I definitely believe that there are plenty of people who believe that stuff to the T. Yeah, the fact that uh, my flies to Hawaii every year to just get predictions is. I was like, that's really. That's a high dedication. Um, I feel like if you just wanted fortune telling, you would just go to wherever is closest, you know. But uh, if you believe that your fortune teller is the real deal, then you're willing to shell out money 
for that. I did love her characterization as someone who, even though she's getting like these very hard truths from her fortune teller, still can't help herself being like proud mom and auntie to her her daughters and bragging about and fussing about them. And, you know, the first few chapters of this book were not that they were hard to get through, but <laughs> it was, it's a lot of auntie trauma being triggered in like the first like two or three chapters, especially when like all the moms get together. Yeah. yeah. I just loved how in the fortune telling scene, uh, my like, brings out these grainy photos of her children's like partners oh like, yeah from, like Facebook <laughs> and stuff it's like is is this the man that my child should get married to and I was just like this is <laughs> this is such like a, a like an Asian immigrant thing to do um just like print out <laughs> metal- images yes yeah yeah but I do love the core of the that the core of the story is explored here which is you know the last question she asks is Will my daughters be unhappy? Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, oh, that's kind of sweet. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, that's usually not the top of the list, you know? So, um, <laughs> like, even only recently, my mom was talking about stuff. She's like, oh, as long as you're happy. I was like, who are you? What did you just say to me? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like a central question all of the characters in this book keep asking themselves is like, am I fucking up? Am I messing up? Like, am I doing the right thing? And, For a lot of this book, a lot of these characters don't do the right thing. They make, like, really bad decisions. And, you know, it's informed by their situations, by the general trauma. But at the same time, it's like, man, this whole family just needs just these therapy yeah, yeah but also this family is like a source of entertainment for their community because their community is like oh this <laughs> this family is cursed and they're always fighting and it's like i don't know I, i just thought it was like really hilarious at like how um the young sisters were <laughs> would be like throwing things <laughs> at like the dim sum restaurant and then they would move locations to like a bomb me restaurant to a bomb me che kali which I've there used to be one right down the street from my house is where they would have like buy three get two free bombies we used to go there go there all the time for for a sandwich I've done that and just and just like the the (laughs) community being like oh it's just another just another day in in our community (laughs) and uh yeah, yeah it's just it was just like very funny and almost like kind of like arrested development. I got a lot of arrested development vibes from this book. Definitely. Definitely. I, um, I could see this family being a family that my my own would look to and just be like shaking their head and just feeling superior to, even though we are not any better. <laughs> um, we, are, we are messy in a very quieter, a quieter way. But the fact that they're uh, much more in, in your face or at least public about some of these things was interesting to me. <laughs> so. All right. We've talked about the moms and I think we should talk a little bit about the next generation of Zong women, <laughs> the daughters, which there are, I think eight characters that we follow in addition to the moms and the grandmother. Um, but we're first introduced to Priscilla, who is the eldest daughter of Mai, who lives in Seattle. She is a CEO of a tech company, and she is dating just the worst yellow fever man in literature. He, I appreciated how bad he was because also <laughs> they did it in a way that was that showed that she was also complicit, right? You know, at the beginning, because she, she was flattered that he wanted to learn about her culture and embraced it and things like that. And there is an element of that. I've dated my share of white men. And, you know, there are some that are open. And then there are some that kind of cross the line. You know, <laughs> and th- and that's kind of like, where where is that line? And I think that was a good way to show it in this book um, as far as supportive versus what he sort of had in mind as sort of a fetishization. And like, he felt like he had some sort of cred for knowing Asian things or something. Um, it, he was a very, I, I enjoyed the characterization of him because I, I felt like we've all known these people. <laughs> oh yeah. 100%. Yeah. And like the, the moment he like talked to the Thai waitress being like, mm. Oh, like, what part of Thailand are you from? And also, like, how spicy can you make oh. my food? It's like, oh, like, make it one star, like, higher than, like, your <sighs> spiciest curry. And I was like, why do white people do this? Just, yeah. like, just eat the food that is given to you. <laughs> it's, it's, 
they need to know. They need you to know that they are better at your culture than yeah. you are. It, it's it's so gross, <laughs> and yet that's why I appreciated this character so much. He, he was very enjoyable to laugh at. Yeah, and also yeah. just like the, same the time, judging of of just like other Asian women in like Priscilla's vicinity being like this guy <laughs> you're you're dating this guy <laughs> like why <laughs> and and that also brings up the question of like for asian americans are you asian enough in the eyes of these types of white men right um yeah. and 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 of course in, in your own community too so like the concept of asianness or asian enough um i liked that it was probing that in a way so even he made her feel bad uh, at times, uh, which I was just like, okay, you know, I, I think at this wise old age that I am, I wouldn't deal with that. But who knows? Like, if you meet someone early enough, what you kind of get a year or two. Yeah. And I mean, in the same way that I was cringing from the Zong sisters, like, auntie off, I was also cringing for Priscilla in, in these scenes because she's just so withdrawn so like you can feel her sadness that like she feels like she deserves this and it's i thought she was really I, maybe i related to her as like an eldest child right like the 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 expectations and even like you know we talk about recovering overachievers like she achieved everything she all of her mother's dreams and but she's still like not happy and that's a real that's a real thing to experience too yeah and also just like her being in her 30s like i think like mid to late 30s in this book and just how she's doing the mental calculations of like okay if i want to get married and have children like i need to break up with mark right now and like jump on the next <laughs> relationship and just kind of like have these calculations and when she's going on these tinder dates like she's categorizing everyone and i was just like this is the sad reality of just not just online dating, but just being an Asian woman in your 30s. Like, as soon as you, um, like, with Mark, she's just like, well, is this the best I can do? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, poor Mark. It's like, if I, if I cut him loose right now, um, will I have, like, a better chance? And it's like, that's something that a lot of um, older women have to think about. And I think that, I think also, like, the fact that, her, she thinks about this family curse of how they're <laughs> never going to be in happy marriages. So she's like, okay, well, if I have to settle, is this a good enough settlement? <laughs> <laughs> I do love that she did cut him loose. I was hooting hollering. I was ready for that scene where she just unleashed her inner my win and just let him have it. Yeah, but she waited too long, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um. And then and we didn't mention that when Mai went to the fortune teller, she did get four predictions, right? That this year there will be a funeral, a wedding, a pregnancy, and potentially a son, uh, which will break the family curse. And were you guys surprised that Priscilla ended up being the one that got pregnant? Huh. I don't know. I don't know if I had it in mind, like who was going to be pregnant at all. So I don't think I was. Yeah, but, same here. Yeah. I, I wasn't quite sure either. And also, like, I yeah. really did not care. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not invested in who's going to get pregnant, I guess. Yeah, so um, she ends up getting pregnant from potentially one of her Tinder escapades and potentially from Mark himself. And you know, her story goes on that she becomes the one that gives birth to the next generation of Zong. Um, I guess we can move on to her sister, wait, Tui, wait. who is before, the middle Before child. we move on, I do like, want to mention how, like, Priscilla has, like, the most estranged relationship with her mom because they had, like, a big blowout fight and then they just haven't talked to each other in a year. <laughs> Which we never learn about what the fight is about. It doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> and not talking for a year, that's so true. <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did find it interesting that out of all of the Wynn sisters, Priscilla was the only one with an Americanized name. Yeah, I was tr I was thinking about that, too. And I wondered if that was like. Uh, like a mark against her with Mark, <laughs> or, you know, because she didn't have an Asian name. Uh, and I also wondered, like, they didn't give us an origin for that, right? Like when she chose no, it, not in terms yeah. of names, yeah. yeah, and also like I think the fight was about Mark because her oh. mom was just like, "Why are you like 
dating a white man. And she's like, well, like you have prevented me from dating, like not dating Vietnamese men, white men, oh, yeah. black men, poor men. Like, where are my choices? And I just don't want to be you in like an unhappy relationship and divorced and bitter and resentful. And of course, like words that, you know, words get out of hand and uh, they don't talk to each other for a year. And I thought it was really funny how after the predictions that um, my God, she immediately contacts her daughter, sending these <laughs> messages through her assistant being like, it's an emergency. <laughs> and like, you're such a bad daughter. Why aren't you doing that? And she's just like, I'm <laughs> I'm not even going to bother to answer any of these messages because I don't oh, yeah. have the mental yeah. capacity to deal with it. Also, like what will become a running theme in all the stories is everything is a self-fulfilling prophecy in not wanting to be like her mother in a bad marriage, but also wanting to prove her wrong that she's not wrong about Mark. Um, she stays in this bad relationship for, for way too long, like you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So next up is the middle wind sister, Tui, who has probably her story is parallel to my as like the emotional core. I feel like like her love story with Andy was the one thread that I was actually looking forward to following throughout the book, mm-hmm. um, just because I think it's the one that has the most um, dramatic stakes um, and like the most like, you know, you really feel like you're rooting for Tui soul throughout her storyline. Right. Yeah. I think the reason why, like, it feels more dramatic and more emotional is because she's actually in a pretty healthy relationship Mm -hmm. and she's being self-destructive so it's like you're cheering her on because you're like oh my gosh like like this is an actual good person andy's a good man like why are you uh like why are you doing this to yourself and just watching someone self-destruct like that of course it's gonna up the stakes and also, like, I love the characterization of uh, Daniel Lay, the fuckboy <laughs> that her mom sets her up with. And I was like, oh, man, I like I feel like Asian fuckboys, they're different. They're they're a different breed. They're like <laughs> he was delightful for me, uh, maybe on the same level as Mark, but maybe even more so because he was actually more entertaining. Uh, oh yeah and less offensive <laughs> definitely more self-aware yeah. like he knows who he is he knows he has mommy issues he knows he has like commitment yeah, issues own it own your fuckboyness and <laughs> um yeah he and he was also still very i don't know how to say this but like fun and nice even though he obviously wasn't about commitment um which is fine but it was just you know when you mislead people about your commitment issues that's the different story but uh, <laughs> yeah this is a, a type of person which I know exists but not really in my orbit um, I never dated a guy like this um, but uh, I, I, I was just like oh I think I knew a few in high school who might have been like this but they probably didn't come into their fuckboyness until like college and afterward um. <laughs> I feel like this type of F boy is almost maybe unique to the Southern California yeah. scene. Uh, and, you know, we got a derivative of this version in my area, San Gabriel, but I think they were definitely out in force in like Westminster, Orange County. Um, <laughs> I feel bad for the Kevin Wins out there because I know quite uh-huh. a few, but I also get why the Kevin Wynn has become like synonymous with Vietnamese fuckboy. I mean, that's funny because like Koreans have like their own fuckboy mm-hmm. and I feel like those are like the Daniel Parks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I I I agree. I think this is uh well maybe by now in like a Houston they have some, but I think this is definitely an OC thing because of the prevalence of um and 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 sort of concentration of um, Vietnamese people in the OC. Um, we had plenty of Asians in Houston, but they, it was probably more of a mix. Um, and I I I think for us then it wasn't the Vietnamese guys who stood out. <laughs> <laughs> Sad to say, um, it was probably the yeah. taller ones. <laughs> so Koreans, Chinese. And connected to Tui's storyline is the gift that kept on giving, the gag that kept on giving, which is that she was the dermatologist for John Cho, the movie star. You know, when when you just land on that one uh, celebrity that everybody knows their name, 
And it gives you so much cred. They have to, you know, name drop it every single time. It delighted me every single time also. Uh, I could see that yeah. happening. Uh, it, look, if I knew Twee, I would probably be saying that every single time I introduced her to. Yeah. Everyone wants to go to that wedding because John Cho <laughs> might show up because the daughter is his dermatologist. <laughs> Uh, I mean, if I had a relative uh, who was a dermatologist, I'd be like, I would like some discount on my face. Like, mm-hmm. give me all of the great skincare <laughs> products you have. Like, I want a facial every month. Like, I was surprised that none yeah. of the family members were like, yo, give me free service. Mm-hmm. And then I did love that tweet as the middle child and one of many middle children in this story um, is the one that stayed in L.A., and is essentially her mother's gopher, right? Yeah, I think that's what, if you're, well, if you're eldest daughter, you often end up doing that. And since there's three, then I guess she gets her pick. So this is the dutiful daughter. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Like, you know what? There's a reason why I moved away from Houston. <laughs> I have to say, like, as someone, like, I am the eldest child. I'm also the only daughter. So I get to be gopher quite often. And, like, after I moved away for uh, college, like, my family, like, was they were, like, super nice. They were like, oh, my gosh, you did so much for us, blah, 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 blah. And as soon as we moved back into the same, like, state slash, like, maybe like an hour away from each other they're just like oh like you have to do all these things for us again and i'm like that's the downside (laughs) of having a family nearby you know but um i think the whole like asian daughter guilt thing was Mm -hmm. bought on (laughs) yeah sometimes they don't even need to ask you to do things you just do it because it's just easier and you know it's just easier yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) Um, when it comes yeah. to like all the streaming services my mom has, if I was living in the same city, I would be resetting those all the time. But instead, oh, I reset mine all yeah. the time for my parents. Yeah, but instead, I told my brother to do that. But I was on the phone resetting it from my computer because she, I was adding her profile. So guess who paid Netflix <laughs> extra so that my mom can get you know her profile now? Oh yeah. no! Yeah, they they turn off password yeah, sharing for different households. So yeah, my mom, you know, she she's worth it. <laughs> but if I worth that extra yeah, eight bucks a month, <laughs> if I were in the same city, I would be constantly doing those things. Yeah, which is why the third sister Tao decided to just fuck <laughs> off. Such a Tao. such a youngest child thing to do, yes. in my opinion. They get away <laughs> with everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And her story follows her as she also makes questionable decisions with the men, um, lusting after um, this very mediocre man that all of her other friends there say, why, why, why this man? You have so many to choose from. Um, but she's off in the new modern Vietnam um, doing, I think she's doing fashion there. Yeah, she has um, her own fashion line. Uh, but kind of just living her best life. But also overcompensating for her overwhelming loneliness being so far away from her family, which I thought was a pretty interesting uh, direction to take her storyline. Yeah, I found her the most intriguing just because it was so outside of my experience um, is the it's the, that second generation that goes back and lives there. <laughs> like I was like, who, who does that? Like what Vietnamese people that is like, I'm sure a, a lot of other cultures do and so i was just like i wonder what she's getting from that but clearly her decision making is um compromised by being so lonely and i think that's maybe something that she didn't take into account um that there is not that sort of you know built-in base basis for you um so i i'm i kept trying to think of what other ways could she have done or created a community for herself that would have let her make better decisions <laughs> because she falls prey to this person. Yeah. She, um, she pines for this mediocre man. And while she's in her feelings, she ends up flirting with um, this guy who's not named for a long time, but it's obviously Mark, <laughs> um, her sister's ex-boyfriend. Priscilla's ex, the, the <laughs> yellow fever dude. Yeah. yeah. And I love how she calls him out on it. Well, not calls him out, but she's like, you're not one of those white guys who's obsessed with Southeast Asia, right? And only date Asian women. And he's like, 
Well, it just so happens that I'm always around Asian women. So, of course, like, I would date Asian <laughs> women. It's just in the statistics. Ugh. And I'm like, oh, God, you're so gross. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, like, I I thought I, I agree with Han. Like, Tao definitely interested me the most because um, just, like, living your expat life back in your parents' home country, that's a... That's like a really cool um, experience that I've seen like more Gen Zs doing rather than millennials, um, especially now that like the global market there has just kind of exploded. And it's just not the same country as uh, what our parents grew up with. And there's this disconnect because they're like, oh, like, why do you want to go back to like a war torn country? And you're like, it's it's not that same country anymore. There's an actual economy. There's actual like in finance you know. terms, they're an emerging market. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I I think about where Vietnam is a lot right now because of uh when you think about Asian countries that have really, you know, embraced capitalism to the extent that they're very well known in the West, you know, Korea, uh Japan. China. And so we know a lot about their culture, about their um, about their entertainment. <laughs> um, but I remember just talking to someone else like, I don't know if anyone can name like a Vietnamese filmmaker, um, which is why I was so excited recently when a couple of them did well at Cannes. But um, so I, I think that would be appealing to Gen Z with this emerging market where you can kind of make your stamp there um, without the com- competition of established people who have already made their name. Um, and and it, maybe it's, it's kind of like, you know, in a small town, you stand out more. Uh, I, there, there must be something appealing to kind of having that freedom to sort of do it the way you want to do it. Uh, but, you know, there's also still communism there. So that's the thing I'm kind of worried about, too. Like, <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, I wonder if it's like, there's a weird sort of communism there, I have to say, different. Um, and um, when I was there, you know, you see all the people in their military uniforms, but then you also just see people just going about their lives doing the stuff. And I remember it was a while back. I wasn't there since early 2000s or mid 2000s. And um, just trying to imagine what it is now, like the best glimpse I got of it was the Netflix movie, A Tourist Guide to Love. And, <laughs> and I was just like, huh, I wonder how accurate this is or if I would be surprised going back um, how different it was since I was there like 15-ish years ago. Yeah. Yeah, like I have friends who went to Vietnam like recently and they've they've told me like, oh yeah, it's like really booming. Like there's actual like Vietnamese pop music that's doing really well. And uh, obviously um, their fashion is doing really well because a lot of the fabrics are in, are made in Vietnam. So they'll talk about how they'll just go to the garment uh, district and just, you know, get stuff tailored and ready made and have it be like under $40. And I was like, wow, what is that like? I can, like, I can never, um, I can never relate to that. And also like my dad, he's been going to Vietnam uh, quite often because um, he works in infrastructure pretty much. So he's like, Vietnam, they keep building things. So um, I'm making my money through there. So I'm like, okay, yeah, it's, it's, like uh, Marvin said, it's like a emerging market. Uh. Yeah. I mean, from what I know about global markets and manufacturing, a lot of the manufacturing jobs that used to be in China are now going to Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's interesting you mentioned pop music because I do know one Vietnamese pop song that is now uh, has become one of those viral dance challenges on TikTok um, called Si Ting. And it's also been featured in Tourist Guide to Love. FYI, um, it's, oh, it's, a, it's a great earworm, honestly. So uh, I've been listening to a lot of Asian pop music over the past year or so and um, and rock music um, from there. But uh, that was one that sort of made it past my defenses, a couple Japanese songs. And um, <laughs> I haven't seen the fashion yet, so I'm going to actually have to check that out. I have, of course, heard of tourists who go to countries just to get stuff made. Um, I was one of those tourists who went to <laughs> Vietnam to get stuff made. So. I have a tailor in Taiwan. He makes good suits. 
<laughs> but like um, the whole expat community that Tao is a part of, like I feel like that is pretty universal in terms of like going back to Asia. Oh. Um, like you know that you're never going to be considered like v- like full Vietnamese, full Korean, full Chinese. So you gravitate towards that community where you kind of have this uh, shared experience of being outsiders. And um, but at the same time, you're like, I feel more comfortable here because no one is staring at me as if like, like um, no one's asking me like where I'm from. And it's a privilege that we don't really have in in a lot of like Western countries because we're not the majority. So I thought that was like a very relatable thing as well, because um, if you're Asian American and you go back to your parents country, you're just like, whoa. Everyone <laughs> looks the same as me, sort of. I mean, there's differences in makeup and clothes, but obviously it's just like I'm so used to being around people who don't look like me most of the time. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess to jump around, that's the experience that we get with Lily, who is <laughs> one of the younger cousins. She is the daughter of my half sister, Kim, uh, Mrs. Long, who is. Um, like we mentioned, one of those family members who reemerged after decades and the cause of the Zong sisters fallout with their mother because she had chose to make it up to her eldest daughter by giving her the house they all grew up in. It's a whole it's a whole mess. But um, Lily is the half cousin to Priscilla, Tui and Tao and is an intern at Priscilla's company. She is someone who's characterized as just like a a full-on STEM person, right? She thinks in numbers and code, and she is really into that stuff. Um, And her story is pretty light. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but um, she gets sent on a business trip to Hong Kong um, where she has those feelings of being amongst Asian faces for the first time in a long time. And her story is just her chasing after another... I, I don't know if this guy is necessarily bad news bears, but definitely not worth going all the way to hong kong just for a second a second chance at like at love right this this peter guy oh uh, like it's hard to say because i mean it sounds like he was like a finance bro who got an opportunity to work in hong kong and you know like when you're young you just go for whatever um whatever job is offered to you and whatever salary is is the highest so it's kind of like you don't really know if he's a red flag. The only red flag that I really saw was him being like, oh, why don't you drop out of your PhD program so you can live with me in in Hong Kong? And I was like, are you serious? You think your girlfriend's dreams are like not as important as your your finance career? Like, that's just like, I don't know. That was a red flag for me. But it also makes sense because we live in a very patriarchal society mm-hmm. where women are kind of uh, encouraged to put their dreams on the back burner for their partners. So I was like, I don't know. Like, like he seemed like a normal dude to me. Um, but yeah. yeah, like when he was like, oh, I don't want to do touristy things because every single oh. time I have friends come over. I was like, I totally understand that feeling. However. Mm-hmm. But this is after if- he was overly intimate and like mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. feely with her. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm just yeah. like, if you're willing to like, if, if you want that second chance, you have to, you have to at least make an effort. <laughs> this was also after the escalator broke, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, which really, like, after that, you cater to her. Like, you give her whatever tourist experience she wants, um, including like a very good shower first. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I felt bad because I've been like, I've been the person who like, we're going to ha- do an Airbnb in this very poppin' area, and then we're going to have a great experience, and then we go there, and it's like, oh, it's closed down. Yeah, yeah, that happens, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Her chapter was short and sweet, but I did find myself endeared with Lily. Um, I was very endeared with her sister, Rosie Long, who is the 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 one member of the Zong clan who just gave no fucks at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, her and Christine are like the Gen Z ABGs, right? Mm-hmm. Who are just like, yeah. fuck the colonizers and <laughs> fuck the OC. We're going to move to L.A. And it was, so I was like, wow, there is hope 
uh, the younger generation have the highest chance of escaping this generational trauma that has just been <laughs> inherited over the years. Yeah. Um, what do we think of Joyce? Um, Joyce is a character <laughs> that immediately reminded me of, or made me think of you, Han, as someone who is knee deep oh, do you in have her a, do you have a K-pop, Korean K-drama fetish? Obs- obsession. <laughs> so here's the thing. I don't necessarily have a fetish, but I have um, very, uh, Marvin knows this about me. If I get into something, I get into it deep. And I go hard for a while. Um, and like, and I call it research. Um, so in the past year, I finally, finally got into K-dramas. And so <laughs> I've also been doing research because, you know, I can't understand this K-drama unless I go back to like 2007 and watch Coffee Prince. And then um, that led to me getting a subscription to Vicky Rakuten. And um, now I'm also watching uh, Japanese, Taiwanese, Chinese <laughs> dramas. Um, and I'm learning all about them, which is now how I also got back into pop music, um, Asian pop music. But yeah, so... What I think is interesting is I, as a culture um, critic, writer, um, I think about these things with American culture, of course. But coming into watching, you know, like Korean media and entertainment, I still kind of look at things with a similar lens. Like some of it's like fascinating and fun, but other stuff is kind of like, huh. But the thing that I notice, of course, is since so many people have embraced um, Korean culture from all walks of life. Um, I have made some K-drama friends and, you know, they each have their K-drama boyfriend, you know, <laughs> that, that that they make no bones about. They're like, oh, it's this guy. And I was like, oh, the one with the dimples because sometimes I don't remember their names yet. Um, and, uh, and, and they are starting to have those parasocial relationships, um, which I, you know, I know happens a lot in K-pop. And so that's where I'm kind of like fascinated with... Um, they're also learning Korean, right? And they're like, it's so hard. <laughs> I'm just like, well, yes. Um, you should probably you- tell them it's the easiest it's the easiest Asian language to possibly learn. Well, because our alphabet is very short. This is the that's sort of the impression I'm getting because I was like, I'm just starting to pick stuff up now, and I was like, huh. I already knew some from my friend when growing up, but I was like, actually, I think I'm getting some right now just through watching stuff. Um, and uh, but yeah, so I, I think it's interesting that I come from it as sort of like, yes, I'm a fan and I'm totally enjoying it, but I'm also sort of critiquing at the same time. But also being in the same community of people who are definitely fetishizing these men. Um, and, you know, that's also part of the industry. I don't know how many K-dramas you watch where everyone's talking about how good looking they are. Right. <laughs> you know, that's part of the plot. Everyone praises how good looking someone is or they praise themselves, which is always funny to me. Um, and I, I there, it's like beauty, of course, is one of the big selling points. So Joyce was fun to me. Um, I felt a little sad that she was so kind of taken in with the the fantasy, especially when it comes to a Korean American um, man. Like, you know, these are just people. Hello. Um, and you can admire, but also know that there is a line. And I think that's kind of where it's uh, maybe it's also because I'm a journalist, you know, like I interview these people. And so I know I don't fangirl out over these people. Some people do um, not to say that's wrong. It's just a different sort of thing approach than I take and I kind of never fangirl out over anyone really so maybe that's just my personality but yeah I, I I love the fact that she had this fetish especially because it's another Asian community admiring a Korean yeah movie. yeah and that happens yeah and it's kind of a mirror to Mark right but then when she does it it's like gross and off-putting right not to say not Mark wasn't gross and off putting, but like like the the reaction to it is more like, Oh, that's weird, which doesn't work in her favor, right? Yeah, I you uh, know Yeah. I, I think the one thing I will say, maybe in her defense, um, is one of the other reasons why I've been getting into K dramas so much is because it has been um sort of my mental health has been kind of like all over the place and it's kind of creates a sort of evenness because it's sort of predictable. If you watch certain ones, they're going to have happy endings. And, um, and it's also just foreign enough that it feels like fantasy. Right. And so Joyce definitely has some issues and she's retreating into 
these K-dramas, which is why she's kind of out of touch. Um, and so that, not to say that that's healthy, but I can almost kind of understand why she's like this. Yeah, I can understand, like, the whole, like, living in a fantasy to escape your mental health problems. Because as someone who also suffers from depression, I was like, wow, this is a very relatable. But I've also met a lot of people who, you know, got into Korean culture and are fetishizing Korean men. (laughs) And, you know, they have gone to Korea to, like, find Korean boyfriends. And, you know, they have dating apps in Korea where you can, like, you know, where, like, guys can find, like, their international girlfriends and, like, it, like, (laughs) it's, like, a whole subculture and it's, like, very fascinating to me. But also, I'm, like, I don't think you understand that Korean men, they Mm. treat, like, non-Korean women differently from Korean women. Mm. I don't think you understand how the patriarchy is built into how they interact Mm. with other people, especially, like, family and um yeah and i was just and like a lot of japanese people also i i learned this uh recently like a lot of japanese people think that korean guys are like so romantic and that's like the that's like the the stereotype they're like oh my god you have a korean boyfriend he must be so romantic because he like they probably do all these surprises for anniversaries for your hundredth day and i'm like yeah korean that's guys you know do. the soft power is working the soft power of the but i'm, not, the I'm just like korean yeah korean machine. guys do that because that's just like you know part of couple culture it has nothing to do with being romantic in my opinion it's like people here you would give flowers to your partner on valentine's day because that's what society expects you to do it's uh, you know, I've actually been reading about this phenomenon a lot as far as people, women traveling to Korea to find their boyfriend and slash for future husband. And a lot of them being, you know, disappointed because, as you say, you know, they might treat foreigners differently. Some of them, you know, especially if they have a, you know, uh, a reciprocal white fetish, um, they might actually treat well. But some of them they treat like lesser than because they think that they are um they're temporarily, which, you know, they could be. And so, and they also kind of know that there is that sort of desperation going on. Um, there's, but also what, when you say that there's almost like this small, small cottage industry, it's weird because I've noticed that on social media too, that a lot of mixed um, race couples are a big thing on social media, like the Korean guy and then whatever his girlfriend is. You know, like the mm-hmm. Australian girlfriend, and I, I there's I know there's a term for it too, but I, I like I watched a couple of those and I was like I don't like this. <laughs> this, <laughs> it, this is just playing into the idea that the Korean guy is the ultimate, you know, idealized romantic, yes, romantic person. I've definitely heard that, and I was just like, you do realize these K dramas are really ridiculously over the top, right? Like, there's no guy who's gonna take like two years to not kiss you. Um, <laughs> and just be like, oh, I touched your hand. And so it's, or wait for you over a generation or whatever it is um, since childhood. There's just a lot going on that I'm like, this is very sweet, but it's also a fantasy. Yeah. So, yeah. Which is yeah. why I like that Joyce ends up with like Liam. a Midwestern <laughs> Korean. He's so fun. <laughs> Liam is fantastic. I, 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 this is something I guess I need to point out is um, Carolyn, when makes really great characterizations and rarely do I ever find um, with all the women characters that I love that so many of the male characters are also delightful Um, (laughs) and probably because they're all awful in different ways Um, except for Andy Andy's great Um, Liam's fine too he's he's, very blunt yeah no I love him yeah he's such a midwestern dude I felt so bad for him because towards like the end of the book I was like is is Liam okay but he seems like he's being held here against his will but he also just kind of is cool with just getting pulled in I feel like he can leave at any time Um, so I think he was also fascinated by this family and the messiness. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would be fascinated too. I'd be like, wow, th- like I thought these types of family feuds and struggles only happened in like soap operas, but to see it unfold in front of you <laughs> is is another level of I guess entertainment, but yeah, I kind of yeah. felt bad for him too because uh you know, it's it's his second date and he's going to a <laughs> wedding. <laughs> he's going to um He's going to Joyce's aunt's wedding. And then there's also like 
a birth that's happening. And it's like, there's so many things that are happening, so many revelations. And he's like, it's a little bit much. Like, even for yeah. Asian standards, this is a little bit much. This is on Liam for accepting to fly from New York to California mm-hmm. for a yeah. wedding for the second date. I mean, in the end, it's it's his own fault. He brought this on himself, to be honest. Yeah, he was game for this adventure. And so now he's deep in the adventure. So yeah. it's all on him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But like the with, last, oh, oh no, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Joyce uh, because yeah. I did tear up a little bit when um, her mother Min like Min thinks that she has uh, cancer or some kind of like heart condition <laughs> because she's having chest pains and she hasn't gone to a doctor and a lot of the herbalist um, concoctions that she's been getting they're they're not working. So Did you she guessed that it was heartburn because I oh yeah one hundred percent knew that it was heartburn. But um, you know she sits down and writes her will and also uh, starts writing a letter to her daughter. And um, this is when she kind of admits like oh like I also have depression and you inherited this mm. from me and because you are my only daughter my only child I'm sorry that so much of my sorrow has been um carried by you and she doesn't finish the letter but like while I was reading it I teared up because I kind of had um the same kind of um conversation with my mother and it was just like mental health is such I mean it's different now in in Asia and also like like third fourth gen uh, Asian Americans but like mental health is kind of for for me and like my parents generation mental health has kind of been like a taboo like you mm-hmm. cure it by you know exercising or just you know it's like oh just you'll be happier when you're older with like more money yeah. with more success and it's like that's not with a baby with, with a family with through through practical considerations though that's yeah how you through practical happy. considerations and um just like and it's and I've thought with my family about it too. They're like, why can't you just be happy? And it's like, well, I can't just be happy because it's a medical condition. <laughs> and it took a lot of it took a lot of years for them to understand. And uh just like having this moment where she is saying all the things that she can't say to her daughter and writing it down. Like I thought that was just like a beautiful moment in the mm-hmm. book. Um that's a but yeah, that's, that's just like from my yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember having some feeling some emotions too during that scene because it's like you know it's what you want you know you, you have all this parent auntie trauma but you also want that catharsis of like when they sit down and be really truthful about what they've been avoiding this entire time and you know that's kind of what this book is also about yeah I, I, and I think yeah. I know a lot of times we talk about like how the older generation doesn't tell you things but you know we also learn to do that as their children and so I think this <laughs> specific plot also was resonating with me because um, like my brother has depression and he also uh, I suspect he, um, me and my mom all have ADHD um, because my nephew has it and it runs the family and all these things align. And, you know, even if we get all diagnosed, I still won't tell my mom. <laughs> Because if I tell her, she will blame herself for genetics. Um, And so there's just a certain amount of um, communication lines that you have to navigate. Um, And and just I don't know if I will ever tell her, but um, it's that was why it was so refreshing that not only did she acknowledge it in herself, that maybe her also her daughter um, has this problem because yeah you you don't ever acknowledge because that's just that's just admitting weakness right <laughs> that being said the fact that they had to take her kicking and screaming to go to a real doctor mm-hmm. to get checked out was hilarious yeah um, my mom doesn't do that i mean she also doesn't love <laughs> um also love this this will lead into our last zong um cousin elaine that at the hospital when she's being checked out she, her doctor is the hottest Korean doctor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> if we're talking about like the Korean fetish right there, but also he did seem pretty fun. Well, I mean, all of the aunties and all of the women there, like even the ones that are paired off were like, wait, 
I'm willing to give it all up for this man. I was just like, where can I get this type of doctor? This this is every medical show I watch that's a K drama. I was like, where are these doctors? Not here. So apparently they're in the OC where yeah. where Elaine gets treated. It's close. We can go check out all the hospitals. <laughs> um, Maybe it's based on a real person. <laughs> but yeah, our last cousin is Elaine, who is the eldest daughter of Quinn, the proprietress of the bikini <laughs> yes. um, coffee shops and nail salons. And I feel like her story is also pretty straightforward. Like she's just living her Westminster hustler life, uh, her Asian ABG lifestyle. Um, she gets into, she helps her mom with like their illicit arranged marriage green card business. Um, and that's how she ends up interacting with Daniel Lei, the fuckboy that is um, being set up with Tui. And I did like that. I, I feel like Elaine's story isn't as you know deep or complicated as the others. Um, she ends up with Hot Doctor, which is good for her. Um, but I did like that how her story intersected with Tui as like, you know, we, we follow Tui and Daniel as they go on their dates. And then you know, Daniel does some really weird things that like gives her, oh, here's your favorite peonies and things like that. And you don't realize till later that Daniel has these two cousins mixed up in his head because they're dating. He's dating them at the same time. Yeah. You know what I also liked about this was the uh, dynamic between Twi and Elaine, because there is some classicism going on there. Classic oh, yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. Because Twi is a doctor and Elaine is a bikini, you know, like <laughs> a boba person. And that totally happens. Yes. Um, I, I'm not going to name names again. A family member definitely talked about some nail uh salon technicians before as if they were of another race almost um and just like you know they're not like us and i was like what what's, what's us and it was just <laughs> but i was like well this is a very true depiction right here about how she looks down on elaine but i was like lane's fun she's cool she knows who she is um and so i yes i was glad that she got a hot doctor i will say though like quinn gave some weird vibes when she was like oh my other family is are my nail shop technicians who live in my office on the floor like pay your workers dude oh, <laughs> wow. man, that's okay. capitalism for you oh, that, God. that's classic yeah uh unfortunately just you're helping them out you're giving them a job <laughs> Like, yeah, they have a place to stay. You know, yeah. you're out of the generosity of your heart. Like I you're like, no, you're a landlord. Lives. You're you're, you're a slum lord at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but like, I feel like uh, with a lot of um, you, you know, there's like class involved to it, and like some Asian American families will be like, oh, I need to send my children to the best elite schools, even if it's like very far away from me. And then there are families who are like, no, you need to like, if you're going to go to college, you need to stay near me and you're pretty much going to live with me until you get married. So I think those are like very two different types of Asian American families. And it just happens that uh, Elaine is kind of, stuck in the the dynamic of like okay i have to like help out with the family business i can never leave my mom because like that would be a betrayal and independence is seen it, the the scale of independence is, is different when it comes to asian american families yeah and also her mom like what kind of weaponizes her own trauma against her daughters too right oh you're gonna leave me too like my sisters did you're gonna leave me alone to fend for myself even though she's perfectly capable of fending for herself um, but I think this is definitely something that is does resonate to because I, I do have plenty of friends who did stay in town because of their family and mm -hmm. still live like within a block mm -hmm. of their parents. Yeah, those are my cousins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong yeah. with that. I think but like it has to be a choice, you yeah. know, you think yeah. they shouldn't feel like they have to. And I, it made me really happy that Christine, the younger sister, she's she and Rosie are like, fuck this or let's move to yeah. L.A. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's representing the two sisters. right? Christine wants to leave. She wants to get out of this town. And mm -hmm. I, I do recognize that. That was how I felt in high school. Too. I, like, I just need to get out of here. Um, just go to San Diego. It's two hours away. It's close enough. So mm -hmm. it's like still close to home, but like far away the way where they can't visit me whenever. Yeah. And then you have Elaine who kind of embraces like she wants to be part of family business. She's like. You know, she she's managing her mom's bikini <laughs> coffee shops and like wants to like 
is kind of embracing this lifestyle and like living it. Yeah, I th- I think it's just that also plays into her knowing herself, um, which is why I had respect for her. I think everyone has to kind of different strokes know what their boundaries are, and if they need, let's say, a few states in between their family, like I did, <laughs> then that's what you do. Um, I have played with the idea of moving to Austin to be closer, but now Texas is not great overall, so <laughs> I that that dream has died. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I, you kind of have to know if you're going to be in a healthy state of mind being near your family or not. Yeah. Yeah. And I just love and- how the other cousin, like Priscilla, Tui, and Tao, they're, they like kind of look down on their cousins, uh, Elaine and Christine, be like, oh my God, like their clothes are so like tacky. Like, what is this like OC style that they're, they're <laughs> having? And I was just like, Oh my god, the OC ASEAN style is so distinct. <laughs> so distinct. <Yeah. laughs> um and so everything comes to a head when um so Elaine ropes in Daniel, who is her like her, who she is kind of dating, um, to help set up a Vietnamese man with a wife in order to do like a essentially a green card scam. Um and Daniel's like, oh, I'm dating this girl whose mom seems single and lonely. She'll be perfect. And so he inadvertently hooks up, while hooking up with these two cousins, hooks up um, Mai with this man. And they end up having like a love connection, which was pretty sweet. I, I like that we had this this storyline, um, which leads to the, the predicted marriage, mm-hmm. um, which also leads to the whole family getting back together. Um but it was nice to it was I loved reading the um uh, gossip network of Westminster going, My win is dating for love. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. Um it is interesting because my mother said that like whenever my dad died, he's he's dead now. Um she would never date again because she doesn't need a guy. And I know that 100% is true. She's just like doesn't want one. <laughs> and I wondered like if it were, let's say, 20 years earlier. Like if she, you know, was a widow at like in her 40s or 50s, if she would have thought differently. But yeah, love is not a consideration for my mother. Hers was definitely a practical sort of um, idea. And and that's why when she was talking to me about being happy recently, it was about me being single. <laughs> and she has <laughs> now come fully around on me being single because she, she was just down on like getting married to the wrong guy and then you waste like 10 15 20 years of your life and i was like oh mom you really need to talk to a therapist Uh, (laughs) so yeah i I was happy about my i thought that was kind of cool and unexpected and maybe something i wish i saw more of around me Yeah. yeah i mean it makes sense that the most jaded uh sister would uh you know find insta love and uh you know, reconciliation with her daughters. <laughs> yeah. Um, which leads us on. I remember you made the comparison to Arrested Development earlier. And I felt like this last, this latter part of the book is when, you know, a good Arrested Development episode is when all the threads start converging in like convoluted ways. And this begins with the family reunion. Everyone comes back to the house they all grew up in. And that's when two sets of cousins and sisters realize that they're dating the same guys um, because Tao brings Mark back home with her to attend the wedding while Priscilla up- arrives pregnant. Um, and then Tui brings Daniel who realizes that this wedding that he's attending is one that he set up with Elaine, who he's also dating. And we have like <laughs> just this big blow up. And then Annie appears out of nowhere and like starts beating Mark up. Yeah. And then Liam yeah. takes out the popcorn. No. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, the cigarette popcorn, yeah. so to say. Both, both. This was an amazing chapter, and I was amazed that it happened, like, almost, like, halfway through the book, right? This was not the climax. This is, like, the first of many climaxes. Yeah, it was in the wedding section, so the second yeah. to last section <laughs> of, of this book. And I absolutely loved it. Um, I was kind of, like oh my God, everyone is showing up at the same time. Shit's going to go down. <laughs> like, who's going to get hurt? Because you see, it's like the moms, they they fight in a dim sum restaurant. They're like tossing things. And I'm like, oh, well, the girls must have got it from somewhere. So I'm waiting for some um, 
some things to be a throne and Priscilla is pregnant. Never mess with a pregnant lady because uh, they like they can get real, real angry and throw things down. So, yeah, uh, I, had a, I had a lot of fun reading that chapter <laughs> and uh, I just loved how like all all the men were just kind of off <laughs> in the sidelines <laughs> it was just like they were either getting beaten up or they were just like all, uh, off to the side being like i'm not gonna get involved this is a th- this is a a women's situation just not gonna bother and i was like yeah they're like a very smart decision they're like was great homer simpson like melting into the bush <laughs> melting well into only the bush. liam has that opportunity the other three are in, in the thick of it yeah no like my's new husband or a uh, fiance at the time oh he was um, also he's just like, like yeah. chilling yeah. yeah yeah he's like um oh we didn't mention bao who was the grandmother's boyfriend <laughs> was also some who just kind of like was just there we just need you know it's just those situations where you realize old people also need companionship especially when their whole family is estranged from them old people are people yeah. too yeah yeah. It also um, reminded me how like the Asian community, very, very small. You know, everyone knows each other. Yes. It is kind of like an incestuous yeah. pool. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, wherever you are, and especially when it's like a specific community, because I'm sure it was kind of like when we were doing that, uh, we were talking about the House of Ho, and it turned out like my cousin went to the same church as one of the people in House of Ho um, because uh, she's in Houston. And then I talked to someone at Top Chef, and I don't literally think we're related, but we turned out to be from this. Um, our parents are from the same hometown in Vietnam, uh, but we might be related. Who knows? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody does know each other. I did really enjoy the wedding scenes. It reminded me of like it's been a while since I've been to an Asian wedding. It, I love that they had their you know it wasn't their ceremony, but it was like their morning of banquet in a dim sum hall. Um, lots of great food imagery in this book. Um, lots of mention of Maggie sauce, which yeah. is something that I don't think a lot of people understand. It's not exactly like a ubiquitous Asian condiment, but if you know Maggie sauce, you know Maggie sauce. Uh, for me, I have to have both Maggie and fish sauce in equal measure. I can never be without. Those were definitely <laughs> my, my go-to condiments. Uh, so yes, a giant yeah. bottle of Maggie sauce also. <laughs> Like, not just a tiny one. Yeah, and for people who don't know, Maggie sauce is essentially just, like, very concentrated. It's like a very concentrated soy sauce, right? It's like a Mm -hmm. very, like, this pure MSG flavor. It it makes things taste beefier, meatier. Yeah. (laughs) And I just love how, like, I I just love how, like, Min Pham, like, when she hears from the doctor, uh, and he's like, you need to cut back on greasy food, you need to cut back on soy sauce, and she's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like... (laughs) Like, do you I not eat understand? All the just to spite you. Mm-hmm. She's like, I, I would rather die a happy death <laughs> than a diet. And I was like, wow, that is very much um, an an Asian response because yeah. a lot of our food it's like is how my dad used to cut back on red meat, but every time he comes home to, to LA, he makes me barbecue for him every other day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which leads us to the ceremony, which the climax was not the actual marriage but the fact that priscilla goes into labor and then we end up with another mad dash to the hospital um lots of things that gets resolved here um twi um reconciles with andy which was a very sweet scene when they proposed to each other um i do like that they ended up together um i think she does deserve another chance and andy's just a nice guy i hope they're i hope they're happy together but this leads us to the what i call the darkest timeline scene which, if you've seen Community, is when Troy comes back to the room and everything's on fire. Because Tweet comes back to the waiting room and everyone's yelling at each other. And the fire is the red-headed man, Mark, who comes because he wants to be a father to his maybe child. Mm. And I do love that it takes this one yellow fever white man to unite the entire Song clan. Oh, Mark. Nothing like a, nothing like a colonizer for all of us to <laughs> uh, team up and... And rise up against. Yeah. Yeah. Just gross. Um, and, you know, he's saying, oh, I've turned a new leaf. I'm a father now. I want to be there for my child. And it's like, you know, it might not even be yours. Mm-hmm. And it turns out it wasn't because the child's born with a full head of black hair, mm-hmm. which the way genes work could still be his child, maybe. It still could be. But I just love how, like, 
this family of women. And of course, like, you know, the culture that they grow up in, it's like, you have to get married. You have to have children. You need to have those things to be happy. I love how they're just like, no, this guy, not worth it. Rather (laughs) have my daughter be a single mom and be raised by um, this like community of women, like fuck men. Yeah. Yeah. Get out. (laughs) And so I was like, yay good for good for, good for like the uh song sisters and and the family just yeah yeah and then hot doctor comes out and says charlie Wynn has been born a healthy baby and <laughs> i did <laughs> i did enjoy the fake out here because the chap the name of the chapter is charlie Wynn, um and like for me personally i know that the prediction was that a grandson would be born but I kind of felt like if this entire book ends on the birth of a boy and that solves everyone's problems that would be kind of like a midway to go out right this this story about women being saved by the birth of a son so i was really happy to find out that charlie turned out to be a girl and i was also like the moment i saw the name charlie when i was like oh they're gonna try to fake me out here yeah charlie's short for charlotte right <laughs> Or it could just be Charlie. Technically, or it could be Charlie. but you know, Asians, I can't remember yeah. exactly. I feel like it's a very Asian thing to name your child the nickname, nickname already. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a. I have to say, it's a weird name for a Vietnamese. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but I think maybe we are removed from the war um, by now. So Charlie is. Oh, not, that's right. Yeah, that's why I thought Ooh. it was a little odd. Um, but we're we're at least what fifty ish years from the war, so I guess that's still uh, too close. That's a little close. I, think. I thought it was generation. an odd choice. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, but yeah, no, I I completely agree. I don't. I think if they were saved by the birth of a, a male child, I would have been very upset, honestly. <laughs> um, but this is also, you know, like w- no matter how much magical realism is in this book, ultimately the fortune teller isn't 100% right, which is very true of all the fortune tellers that have ever advised my father. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, which uh, was fun for me. And yet they they never waver with their faith in these people, no matter what happens. They're, they'll be like, oh, maybe they just knew it was going to be named Charlie or something. You know, they, they rationalize why they still need to go to Hawaii to find this person. <laughs> So um, I do yeah. enjoy the chapter that where we learned that the curse was never real. He was she was just fucking with that that yeah, yeah. bitter old woman, and you know the curse where the, the curse was really the friends we made along the way because in truth there's nothing wrong with having Vietnamese daughters. Yeah, yeah, and and in fact, like uh, Wang Zung, the uh, the originator of the curse, she wanted a daughter, mm-hmm. and she thought that like she wasn't allowed to wish for a firstborn daughter and you know like i thought that was like really nice because um it just shows that vietnamese daughters like even though our culture even though like a culture and patriarchy says they're less than i mean they're just as loved you know um and i loved how the book ended with priscilla going to hawaii <laughs> <laughs> to see the same fortune teller and i was like oh my gosh who's like, now become insta course. famous apparently yeah. Yes. yeah yeah but it was like nice because like priscilla is someone who is you know she works in tech she believes in number and data and she's going to see this fortune teller because this is something that her mom did as like part of her tradition and also because she loves her own daughters and she wants them to be happy and it is a chance for her to you know i guess get one step ahead and see if she can do anything to secure that happiness for her daughter so i really like the way the book ended and we see that she herself is having issues with her teen daughter and like her direction in life and it's you know the refrain in this entire book is this generation will be different this generation (laughs) will solve all the problems but it's like no you'll never solve the problems but you know it seems like at the very least their relationship is less estranged than hers was with her mother so there's been some progress yeah which is nice and it ends with priscilla asking auntie hua the same question that her mother asked at the end which is do you think my daughters will be dot 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 which i hope Instead of asking if they are unhappy, I hope that she asked, will they be happy? That would mark mm-hmm. progress, right? Like the the thought that there is a possibility for happiness. Yeah. 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 What a book. 
what a it's not the longest book too it's like only like less than 300 pages right but so much happened yeah packs it in but that i think helps the energy <laughs> keep the energy up we had some good reads uh comments in our uh forum in our discussion forum and i'm just gonna go through some of the thoughts that our uh listeners had uh, Nina says, cute little story. It was fun reading about all of the relationship entanglements and relatable to read that some parents are apologetic and <laughs> kind for a second and then returned to their old ways of being judgmental and mentally unhelpful. That's just having uh, Asian parents. Yes, this is. Yeah, that's just having Asian parents and also just like boomer parents in general. I feel like uh, like apologies do not come as as easily for them. Um and then our next listener's comment is from Jin. Um, they said, my biggest question while reading was, is the curse real? And I was flipping between yes and no several times. In the end, I couldn't decide. And I'm excited to hear about everyone's insight on the matter. Yeah, that is true. Like, it did make me question. I was like, what are the chances that this entire family is just made up of girls? Like, the statistics is... It's kind of wild. So I don't know. It happens. I mean, I have a friend. My college roommate has four daughters. So sometimes it just it just turns that way. I have a good friend from high school who yeah, is but it's like, it's the like fifth of six three, daughters. Three, four, five generations of just daughters, <laughs> yeah. though. And it's like, that's really interesting. Yeah. How how does that I happen? I mean, even if the curse wasn't actually real, believing it makes it real, right? Like believing that you are cursed puts you on that trajectory that like you're not to blame for your actions it's the curse that's making everything bad yeah, yeah yeah our last comment is from bells and they said honestly i found the beginning of the book really slow there wasn't anything inherently wrong with the writing i just feel like it didn't captivate me however i'm glad i continued reading because it really grew on me my heart has a tender spot for mother-daughter relationship stories being the daughter of an immigrant mother myself I just loved all of the hilarious chaos that happened whenever three or more characters came together. I'd say this was a pretty good book overall. I do ag agree with it starting a bit slow, but I think that's just like with this many characters, you need to like build up to it. And of course, like in the beginning, you don't really know what everyone is going through. So you're kind of impatient to like just like get the story going. Um but I will say that, like, because there were so many characters, I kind of wish, like, uh, we focused on just maybe, like, three of, like, the main daughters were Priscilla, Tui, and, and Tao. And, like, I feel like those were the, um, they were kind of, like, the spine of the story. So, I don't know. Like, uh, overall, like, I did like the cast, but the focus... I actually didn't. Maybe it could have. It, it, I actually didn't mind it as much because I think the the sheer amount of characters and the chaos they brought was really delightful. And I actually thought I didn't never felt that the book started slow because even in that first chapter with the with my meeting with Auntie Hua, the the psychic, she was already bringing that chaotic Auntie energy, like just humble bragging about her children and like ignoring everything and you know that only escalates in the next chapter which is the first meeting of the three sisters yeah i mean it's it's a book about generations <laughs> of of women so obviously every generation has their own baggage it's it's a lot yeah. to go through so i mean like i i don't think it was a bad book i thought i enjoyed this book quite quite a lot um, but I can understand if a lot of readers, uh, listeners out there are saying like, oh, it took me a while to get into it. Like, it is I a lot. I mean, it took Han like a good 10 minutes to sort through all the characters before we got started <laughs> coming back to this book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 30, 30 minutes before the show, I was just like, okay, I need to write down every single name <laughs> and like do like a freaking like family tree diagram. And like, I mean, you could probably, yeah, like th these are my yeah. notes right now. It's just, it's like a total total yeah. chaos so understandable yeah. all right well with that um that'll do it for our discussion of the fortunes of jaded women which i just realized today has a double meaning because all of the uh -huh. zong women in this book wear jade jewelry and i felt very smart figuring that out even though it was like right before i mean isn't that isn't that just like a a Chinese and Southeast yeah, it's like Asian a Buddhist thing, thing, like mostly, you, right? Yeah, it reminded me that for some reason I don't have any jade, and I'm like, what kind of Asian am I? Um, 
But yeah, I mean those so bracelets like you never take them off, right? It's just, they're just on there. Well, they like you you grow into them, <laughs> so it won't even be able. You'd have to like actually dislocate something or like cut yeah. it off or something. That sounds. <laughs> I mean, as someone who is like part like Koreans, we don't have that kind of thing. <laughs> like with the with the jade like uh, jewelry being passed mm. down. So I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, if you have thoughts on The Fortunes of Jaded Women by Carolyn Huynh, let us know on Goodreads. Or if you're a subscriber to our Patreon on our Discord, we always love to hear your thoughts. But with that, Rira, can you let us know what we are reading for book club for the month of June? We are reading We Have Always Been Here by Lena Wen. And it's a psychological sci-fi thriller uh, that follows a doctor who must discover the source of her spaceship cruise madness or risk succumbing to it herself. It is very alien like yeah. inspired. Um I space horror, space thrillers like really freak me out. Like Gravity is like one movie that I like cannot rewatch <laughs> because it just gives me so much anxiety. So we'll see. We'll see yeah. how I fare reading. Because this, this book. is our first creepy space story, so I'm excited to to get into that. Um Han. Thank you so much for joining us and discussing um, this book. Um, if people want to find more of your thoughts, where can they go? Uh, I guess I am on Twitter still and Instagram at Hanonymous. Yeah. And if you want to hear more of Han's insight into pop culture, check out the podcast that we do, Good Pop Culture Club, um, also a part of the Potluck Podcast Collective. Um, but with that, that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. gets a little crazy sometimes. Sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's beautiful, and sometimes it can just piss us off. Enter First of All Podcast. It's a safe space for real conversations about the things that we all struggle with, celebrate, contemplate, and work through in our daily lives. I'm your host, Mindy Chang. I'm an actor, filmmaker, and entrepreneur with a colorful background, a full life, and brilliant friends who I love to unpack life with to share with all of you. They are everyday people like you and me, ranging from award-winning artists, cultural icons, powerful CEOs, my hilarious childhood friends, and even my mom. Tune in for honest conversations on mental health, dating, sex, family, career, culture, and everything in between. Listen to First of All wherever you find podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective.